Everyone wants their bass to be huge in their production, and as a result, everyone wants to know, what is that bass mixing tip to get huge bass? But in this video, I'm gonna show you the one thing that you can do that has absolutely nothing to do with mixing that will make your bass sound way bigger. Now, this one technique has a couple strings attached, so you need to make sure you watch all the way through so you don't miss something really important, because you can do this and still be in a scenario where it isn't working if you don't check a couple other boxes. So the technique is this. If you want bigger bass, then you have to have a less busy arrangement. Now, I'm gonna talk about how that works. I'm gonna show you an example, what things cause problems and how to avoid them. But in simple terms, the busier your arrangement is, the harder it is to have a big bass sound. And the reason is actually really simple. The more you have going on in arrangements, the less ability there is to focus on individual pieces, right? So like the bass is one piece of a broader arrangement. So if you want your bass to be huge, then you need to arrange in a way that provides the bass the opportunity to be huge. So a lot of producers will have these really dense arrangements with loads of things going on. And they're thinking that those things are going to accentuate the bigness of the production. And, and to be clear, uh, I have definitely fallen into this trap myself, but it actually usually does the complete opposite of what you want. It creates too much clutter, which then provides way less room for the bass to be as prominent without making dramatic mixing decisions to just turn everything else down, which is really not that ideal. So let's take a look at a production of mine here as an example. I'm just gonna play a little bit of the chorus and I want you to really pay attention to how big the bass is. All right, and I'm gonna show you this with the vocals first and then we'll go ahead and kind of isolate a few things. Guy on fire. stop it there. So as you can hear, the bass sounds huge, the drums sound huge, but if we really kind of break it down, and I know you might be looking at this thinking, wow, there's just a lot of stuff going on. There's really not as much going on as it seems. We're just going to go ahead and mute out these vocals here, and let's go ahead and just take a look at what the instrumental sounds like here. And I'll go ahead and open up a couple of these uh, track stacks here. All right, let's just take a listen to just the instrumental. <laughs> Okay, so as you can hear, the bass is obviously very big, it's very fat, it's 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 aggressive, and obviously this is going to change based on the context of what it is that you're doing. You might be going for more of a pop sound. The concept is the same, so I don't wanna get hung up on the stylistics fact that this is kind of in that hard-hitting, cinematic, epic, pop kind of vibe. If we just look at the instruments that are happening here, it's pretty much all this stuff, all in here. This is what's going on, and then everything but down below here this is all drums. We're not gonna worry about drums right now because drums really do fall in a completely different category of rhythm that are not gonna be taking up space in the same kind of way in the arrangement as much as these instruments that have pitch. So if we just really pay attention to how many things are happening in this production that have pitch, we've got all this stuff in here, which is what we'll call the keyboard elements. We'll just listen to what these sound like in isolation. All right, so these are obviously much, much higher in frequency, pitch. They're much, much higher in pitch. Those things right there are not going to suck up a whole lot of space away from the bass. Really where you're gonna start running into problems with having too much going on is when you have too much going on in the low mids and in the lows and in that middle range of pitch. So these are happening higher up in frequency. We can get away with quite a bit more happening in those higher frequency spectrums, okay? Then we look at what we've got in the strings here. And if we look at what we have in the strings, this is what we've got. That's all it is, is these staccato builds, if you will. And these are kind of what's doing the big build and kind of crescendo into this, right? And these are just fundamental things. In a, in a lot of ways, this is just chords with a nice little bit of attack on it, right? And then we do add a little bit of brass here uh, as well with the trombones. But again, these are actually accentuating the same kind of thing. So this is kind of one of the bigger and broader points with all this is if you're gonna have layers of things, make sure these layers are doing either very similar things or even the same things. So of these strings, we've got a couple different strings. They're all kind of doing the same thing. They're doing the same rhythm. And then we throw in this trombone, which is an octave lower, but it's doing a very similar type of pattern. It's doing a very similar type of thing. And if we go further up, we had these trombones. <laughs> Right? So obviously we've got this whole trumpet thing going on there. And that is literally it. That's it. And then we've got our bass, which I'll show you what the bass sounds like here. Okay, so this is the bass.
All right, and that sounds huge, right? That sounds very, very big. And then you complement that with everything else going on instrumentally. And if we were to throw all the instruments in here, you'll notice it is not as busy as it seems. There's not as much happening here as it seems. And that way when we add that vocal, there's plenty of space for the vocal, and then the drums are really rounding everything else out. And again, in the context of the whole thing, it sounds like this. If we were to have just a bunch of keyboard elements going on and all this other mid-rangey stuff happening, that actually steals away energy from the bass. And because we don't have as much going on, it gives me more opportunity and more space to bring the bass sound up, which gives that bigger sounding bass. So when we're thinking about the relationship between like the arrangement and overall size of how something actually comes across, it seems a bit counterintuitive to say, but the less you have going on, the more you can squeeze out of what you do have going on. In other words, if you have fewer things happening, then that allows you to get more loudness from the few things that are happening. Now, I obviously do have a lot of tracks in the session as, we, as we've talked about, but we don't have all these tracks happening simultaneously because that would actually do the opposite of what I'm wanting. If you want clarity in your bass, then stop thinking that EQ or some mixing hack is the secret. Like those things are helpful. Don't get me wrong. You can use EQ or multi-band compression or saturation for bigger sounding bass, 100% true. But if you don't have this part nailed first, then those things are not fixing the bigger issue, which is that your arrangement needs to be conducive to making that possible in the first place. That brings us to one of these uh, so-called strings attached that I mentioned. This only works if you start with great bass sound. Sound selection is absolutely crucial. It's also really hard to talk about, but in this example here that I showed you, you know, if we solo out these bass sounds here, right? They sound great on their own, just as, as bass. It's very, very big, right? This sounds very, very big. We have a very great sounding bass sound, which makes all the difference. If we were to have a bass sound that simply just does not do what the bass needs to in terms of sonics and sound choice, then sure, we can have this great arrangement that has lots of opportunity for that bass, but you're just not gonna have the sound that's gonna make it possible. And again, if this just wasn't that good of a sound, just bumping up some of the lows with an EQ is not gonna fix that. So you can have a great arrangement, but still miss out on the actual sound choice and still have problems where the bass isn't working. So let's just actually pull up a couple of examples of what I would kind of classify poor bass sounds or bass tones. And this is the kind of thing that I see a lot of amateurs doing. They'll, they'll pull out these sounds that just don't, don't have the fatness and the richness that they need. Okay, so something like this bass sound. This is just a Super 8 plugin. It's a synth from Native Instruments. Okay, that right there, it's like, okay, that's, that's fine and all. But that's just not like... That, that's not like a great bass sound. It doesn't have the fatness. It doesn't have any, any bite to it. It doesn't have any attack to it. That's gonna really add some roundness. But what's crazy is just by manipulating the sound a little bit within the actual synth itself, I could take this and turn it into a completely different sound by just adding some chorus and even just a little bit of reverb. This alone, let's bring down the level and the size a little bit on this reverb here, is gonna make a big difference. Versus those being off. Makes a massive difference, okay? And so that's the first thing, is that this sound, we can modify and manipulate just within the plugin itself to get it sounding better. And, and I know this is just one example. This is one example. Let's actually take a look at more of like an actual, you know, electric bass guitar type example. You know, and I've, I've heard plenty of people using some of the stock ones in Logic. I'm just gonna show you the issues with this. You're gonna see people just using these like finger style bass. So yeah, that just, that just doesn't sound good. So obviously this is a much more extreme example. I think we can agree that those sounds are just not gonna accomplish that big bass sound uh, that we would want in the end. Obviously, neither of those sounds are really fitting the context of this specific track either. I'm just trying to give you a, a, a general idea of just, there are lots of examples of bass sounds that just don't work. So the starting point is just making sure you have a great sound in the beginning. Like I spend a fair amount of time making sure the sounds I'm using are the right sounds. And I am working on a video on sound selection and how to get better at this. That's not the topic of this video, but it's a super important important point that if you fail to have a great bass sound right away, then it almost doesn't matter how great your arrangement is. It just won't sound that big. And one of the other things that I do, and you, you can see it in this example right here, is I layer bass sounds. And most of the time, in my experience, a single bass sound is not going to accomplish the size and scope of sound that I want by itself. So I am typically going to layer my bass sounds. And the way I'm doing this is thinking about bass, not just in terms of the low end, but in terms of sonic complexity. Does it have some bite to it? Does it cut through the mix? And I'm almost always looking for two 
two distinct bass sounds that complement each other. In other words, one's gonna have that low end, right? The low end that we need. And the other one is gonna typically have more of the bite and the attack. It's gonna allow that bass tone to cut through the speakers and they should not compete with each other. In other words, if I have you know two bass sounds that are both hogging up a lot of space in 40 to 80 hertz range, then I'm very often either gonna cut one out so they're not gonna be grinding up on each other or I'm just gonna find a different sound altogether. So let me just show you what these basses sound like. Again, here's, here's both of them together. Okay, so if we think about how that sounds, we've got that nice fat low end, but then we have the bite of the bram, right? Which is that kind of brassy sounding sound, essentially. But this is what I actually started with, was this sound right here. But that sound by itself would just not work, right? If I only had that sound, if I muted out this bram, listen. It's got the low end, it's got the low end, but it's not cutting through the mix, right? So just by adding another layer in here, which is this bram, Okay, which does have low end. I'm not saying it doesn't have low end, by the way. I'm not saying roll off all the low end. I'm just saying make sure they're not grinding up against each other. Now, listen to this in context again. That bram is cutting. It's bringing your attention to that sound, that pitch, and then that low part, it's actually adding the fatness on the bottom end. Now, the second string attached is that when you are arranging your music, a really powerful technique when getting very large sounding bass is to not overdo it. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean that if you have a massive sounding bass, like, like this, all the way through the track from start to finish, it's very hard to maintain a high level of interest, which means that the longer you have that going on, the more your audience's ears adjust to it. And as a result, they become numb to it, right? So if you want a really big sounding bass, then you can arrange and produce in such a way that saves those moments for the climax. Like for example, you know, EDM will often wait to give you that massive, massive bass until it drops. If you play close attention, then there's not a massive bass sound before it. And usually it's gonna be either no bass sound after it or a very significantly reduced uh, bass sound after the drop to make sure that there is dynamic range in the production. If you want to really level up your productions overall, then arranging dynamically is so powerful. And talking about bass is just one component of that. But if we look at the example that I'm showing you right in here, let's actually take a look at this whole bass sound. Look at this, the bass sound that I'm talking about doesn't even happen until two minutes and 25 seconds into the entire higher track. We don't get it at all. Let's actually listen to like verse two. This is verse two. I'm not saying we don't have bass. Of course we have bass. We have this little uh, filtered out bass here. That's a cool sounding bass. It's not as big and aggressive and as epic as the one that I feature later on. I'm waiting to give it that big and massive bass tone. So we, we're not getting that big bass tone throughout the whole track, right? We, we really only get into it at that second chorus, right? And, and I'm doing things like filtering out this bass, by the way. If we look at the first chorus, this is the very first chorus. You can see here, we do have bass, but listen to how it sounds different. Compared to later on. Completely different, completely different. I'm saving it, it's filtered out. You still got that low end. I'm not saying we don't have low end, okay? I'm just saying we're waiting to give it the absolute max, right? We're waiting to crank it up till the end. And this really is about arranging strategically. If you are saving those moments for when it makes sense, right? Which is later on in the track for me in this case, you can see some really game changing results with your music. Notice that I'm using one, two, three, four, five, six different bass sounds throughout this track. We've got these three that are layered together here at the beginning. Then we have another one. So if we're thinking about these just broadly speaking, we've got a bass sound here. Let's say these three are all one sound. That's kind of how it's perceived right here. Then we have a completely separate second bass sound in second verse. And then we have a third bass sound for the rest of the song at the end. So when I'm producing, I am constantly asking myself, how can I hold that off a bit? to make it so it's more satisfying when that big moment does happen. I wanna make it so that when that moment happens, it's like, oh my gosh, that was sick, right? We're waiting, we're being strategic. If you are being strategic in your arrangement and production, then you can get a huge bass sound that's not just great in terms of space, right? Like we've talked about, but it's great because it's not being overused or overdone. Too much of a good thing becomes either not a good thing anymore or just a boring thing. Don't hit your audience over the head with a massive bass sound the entire song. Trust me, they will get bored. It will lose its effect over time. And much faster than you think too. So I talked about dynamic arrangement here and I have a whole video walking you through how you can add contrast and dynamics to your own arrangements. I barely covered it here in this video. I go into more detail right here. So we'll see you in that next video.